You don't have to. Hey, hey everybody, uh, this is uh, Dave. Just uh, want to welcome everybody. We're just getting everything set up. Um, just uh, you can find us on YouTube live right now, but we'll probably be getting ready to go in about 30 seconds. You shut the door. Okay, just want to welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series uh, presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, we have uh, a couple of great guests on today. Um, our US National Team Development Program Director of Sports Science, Brian Galvin, and two of his right hand man uh, people, Will Morlock and Juan Gonzalez. I want to remind everybody that um, if you have any questions, please put it on the Q&A and Will and Juan will be kind of answering those questions as uh, Brian goes along. And then on YouTube, if you are watching, you can put it on the, the YouTube uh, chat box and we will try to answer on that as well. So um, really excited to have Brian. Brian is in his first year with the U.S. National Team Development Program. And, um, you know, just by talking with all of the coaches there has really kind of open a lot of eyes on really the sciencey part and with his background um, coming from Chicago. Uh, Brian was, is a hockey coach, um, played hockey, and uh, really excited for him to dive into this at-home training. And um, we're going to have a lot of this stuff on our usahockey.com slash dryland <laughs> page. So you'll be able to check it out there. So um, Brian, uh, the shows are yours. I'm going to stop my share. And then you can share. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, just a quick uh, background on, on our, myself and my team here. Uh, we own a small company in Chicago called GVM Performance. And we got into off-season training about 12 years ago, my brother and I, uh, selfishly, to help him make money while he was playing hockey in the minors. Um, and it just kind of snowballed for us. And we really have dove into athletic development in the last five, five, six years. Um, we work with a lot of AA programs, a lot of AA level athletes uh, from might all the way to pro. Um, actually, a quick thanks to Kent Allen, uh, hockey director in Illinois, if, if he's on here. We, uh, he was kind of the driving force for us to kind of put these programs that we were going to go over today together. Um, I think the day after the COVID hit and everything got shut down, he was immediately emailing the programs. So our first kind of template was made for them and sent to him. Um, and then it just kind of sparked the idea of maybe put something together a little more comprehensive uh, to help families. So from there, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right. And let's go and share screen. All right. All right, are we good or no? Yep. We're good? Okay. Yep. All right, so let me slide back up. So first slide here is um, an additional information sheet. And when we started putting the programming together, we kind of realized, you know, people need to kind of know how to read our workout sheets. Um, Supplementary exercises, dynamic warm-up exercises, and regression, uh, progressions and regressions for exercises. And one of the problems I'm sure a lot of you are having, and a lot of problems we've been getting, is just lack of equipment and being people being stuck at home. Um, so that's kind of why we put this together. And I'm not going to spend too much time on here because once you have access to these. Um, all everything blue is hyperlinked so there's a video on here how to read the workout sheets from 8 to 12 a video about for 13 and up um, because from 13 and up they're pretty much all the same 
um, an introduction to tempos and an emphasis on technique and quality over quantity. We're very big with that. And throughout the workout sheets, you're gonna see uh, hip activation series um, that we use body weight for, but we wanted to put a supplement in there to that um, for mini bands. So like I said, everything on here is hyperlinked. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you guys. Um, so the first sheet here is eight to 12 years old. Um, the dynamic warm up is a full dynamic warm up. And we actually got an email with someone asking, um, saying that this is the wrong warm up. Because if you go to the additional information sheet, there's a kid's version. Um, that is not correct. This is the correct warm up. And I think one of the proven things in fitness that works uh, is just move. And that's what dynamic warm up is. Um, and I think for even for little kids uh, from eight years old all the way to pros, it's pretty much the same format and the same template. Um, it's just trying to follow an order. I think the difference you see with my uh, younger players to older players is them doing the exercises with more intent. But I think following this warm up, even if you're your eight to 12 year olds do it, because the, the, the tough thing with that age is the athleticism is so different. And we've been running these workouts um, through our Instagram and I have a nine year old that's pretty advanced and I have a, a 12 year old out there. Um, so we pretty much follow this same dynamic warm up, and this is the same one you'll see at this one all the way to the, to the older kids. So if your kids just even do half of this, that's good. Um, the part I wanted to explain um, that we haven't, uh, that most people leave out of dynamic warm up is activation. And a lot of programs, you'll see this the opposite. You'll see the activation first, and then the warm up secondary. We do it the opposite way. Um, I think it's good to just move, then get, then start doing muscle activation. So what that is, is just getting the hips fired up before you start doing sprinting or plyometrics. Um, that's where we kind of see a lot of common injuries. So curtsy squats is a great exercise for hip activation. Get your butt really fired up and your glutes. Um, and then you'll see on day two here, plie squats is also in there. And what that does too, and I tell the kids this, is when you – you do an activation series every day, even if it's just 10 split squats right, 10 left, and a plie, that's 30 squats a day. And that adds up over time, right? You're doing 10, 20, 30, and then you're looking at three to four to 500 extra squats a month just through body weight. So how the workouts are laid out, Monday, uh, it's a three-day lift cycle. And this is almost the same that you'd see with a pro player. Um, Monday is geared towards strength and conditioning. Wednesday and Friday are all geared towards strength and conditioning. Tuesdays and Thursdays are all movement. Now our priorities at NTDP and at GVN in general are all are always movement, mobility, and flexibility. Secondary priorities would be strength, speed, and power. So if you progress too quickly and you start working on speed and power and more strength when you can't move really well or when you do not move really well, that's when you start to see imbalances develop over time. Um, that's something that was very, very, very common back in the 80s, 90s. Um, strength conditioning has taken a major turn, especially in the U.S., especially with hockey, just in the last eight years. Um, so I'm going to move on from this one. You'll see day, day four, day five. Um, and just quickly, on uh, day five here, strength. So you'll see goblet squat and notes, BW meaning body weight or dumbbell. And the reason I, we put body weight or dumbbell was if you have an eight-year-old and he has a good squat pattern, and as he gets a little older, like my nine-year-old just started using a 10-pound dumbbell. And why did I let him do that? Well, his squat pattern is really, really good, and we're doing off-ice every single day because we're not playing any hockey right now. Um, now I'm gonna move on to the 13, let's see, 13, 14. And so here you'll see for the strength progressions. Now this kind of brings us into, you know, either limited equipment or should kids be lifting weights? And this is a, a pretty common question we get a lot. And, and I think that's, from eight to 12 years old, you know, weights is definitely not a priority. Um, but resistance training can be done in a lot of ways. And that could be just slowing down your exercises. Um, so as we progress, 
through the from eight to 12 years old and 13, 14. Now you can see we took the body weight away and we added a tempo here. So this is a three second squat where the athlete's going down for three seconds. So that tension, right, in the push up and in the squat added resistance. Like your body is a weight, right? So if you slow your, 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 your athlete or your squats down, that's gonna create resistance the same way a weight would. So as your athlete moves better and better and better, gets stronger and stronger, that's when you can start to add in more and more and more weights. Um, and if, you, if people have any questions as we're going on, please feel free to shoot them in uh, so it's not uh, me lecturing the whole, the whole, the whole time. Um, so, 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 Brian, I, I yeah. have a question. So you talked about the most important things being movement, mobility, and flexibility. Um, and then second up being strength and conditioning. Why is that super important for these, these young players? And young, I'm talking about 18 and under. Um, well, it's, that's a good question. So movement is a priority because if you, you don't move really well and you start getting stronger, right, you're going to probably develop an imbalance, right, or uh, an asymmetry. So that's something that we, want, that we want to correct as early as possible. And I think, you know, in the early, you know, the 80s, 90s, like I said, especially, well, let's just use the United States in general. Like off ice was not a priority um, in, in any, any organization. I think in the last eight to 10 years, you've seen a big uptick in, in strength conditioning. Um, and gro like groins, for instance, groins used to be um, a huge problem in, in, in hockey. And it's pretty much been figured out, right? We, we don't see that anymore. Now it's more just shoulder injuries. And I think mostly that's come from just the game being so fast, not so much an imbalance. Um, you really can't prevent a player from getting banged into the boards, um, you know, and then those kind of things. So, but like I said, soft tissue injuries and hip injuries have pretty much gone away, uh, except for goalies. You really just don't see that because we've corrected imbalances. We've, we have an emphasis on strength and conditioning now, um, an emphasis on movement. And I think you, you, that's where we've kind of seen that change. And I know uh, in the past we've had uh, Dean Krelars in or talking on the webinar about physical literacy and the importance of starting kids early and making sure that we continue because that's an important part because their studies have shown if, we're not if they're not able to move, they're actually more prone to actually concussions and other things because they're not able to physically get out of situations um, coming. So I think that's important to know during the ADM, ask the ADM managers, the coach uh, Joe Bonnet really talked about what you could do when you don't have a lot of space. And, you know, sometimes you go to the rink and it's cold, whatever, and kind of something that we just want to make sure that we have it ingrained and we're doing a better job overall. However, I think we can even continue to get even better because the better athletes, the, the, the better we make our athletes who are our hockey players, the better they're going to perform on the ice. And unfortunately they're taking away uh, PE and all this other stuff. And uh, I think this is a great start and why that movement mobility and flexibility is so important because those are those building blocks that will help get them strong, get them ready. So, sorry, keep on no, going. No, no, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reality here too is like this is unprecedented what's going on um we've never had this much time off the ice and, and you're right kids aren't playing multiple sports anymore um and i don't know if that's good or bad i kind of think it's just kind of the evolution of society and what's going on you know um i think this is a, a time though we could also take major advantage uh one of the big issues in hockey isn't so much uh, hip dysfunction anymore it's ankle dysfunction right we're seeing kids with just locked up ankles and they can't squat and parents are like well my kid he can't squat he can't squat he needs to get faster well they're skating all year round the boots are getting so strong and so supportive uh, that your kids are losing ankle mobility uh, brian kane prodigy hockey um, he's a huge advocate of kids not you know, lacing up that top hole and keeping them really loose so those ankles can get strong. I do that with my kids, and, and I see a major difference in how they run. Um, and and that, in that all the way up to the NTDP players, like we've, we've never had this much time off the ice before. Uh, we were doing a, a mobility session via Zoom yesterday, and a couple guys we have that have hip problems are looking really, really, really good. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a side effect of this whole scenario. Um, this is how hockey used to be. You, you know, my brothers and I, we, we threw, we joke, we, 
you know, we have all this training now. Everybody has a trainer. We threw rocks at each other and ran hills and went to the park and played roller hockey and, you know, and, and wrestled and did those kind of things. And, and you are seeing less of that, especially in the cities, big cities. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit on a tangent. Uh, Juan, and, Juan and Will are supposed to stop me when I do that. Um, but we'll move on here. So one thing you can see in the workouts, too, we put a lot – that's why I said movement a priority. Every day there's movement. Every day you have sprints. Every day you have plyos. And I think that's just super, super important. We're really big with the speed ladder. I think that's great for not just uh, building athleticism, but getting those ankles moving and building up ankle strength. Uh, is a, uh, a speed ladder is a great tool for that. And as we progress on here to the – let me move this over – to the 13, 14 workouts, you can see – now you're seeing more and more loaded exercises, okay? So the squats are getting a little more, the temples are getting a little more aggressive. That's the little number on the side there, the three, zero, zero. Um, and a little, uh, the sets are getting higher. With the kids, we usually keep the sets a little bit lower in that three range, um, especially the strength portion. And you can see the progression, right? If from the eight to 12, the strength portion is about 10 minutes, you know, and there's more emphasis. And that starts to shift as these kids get older and older. And I'm just going to scroll past the 15 and up to the full equipment. Um, a lot of people ask why we use our bilateral exercises. And because there's a lot of trainers out there that's everything single leg, single leg, single leg. And I think that's kind of silly. I think we need to do both. Um, you cannot produce, there's no exercises out there that produce more force than bilateral exercises. That means like a hex bar deadlift, uh, a squat, a barbell squat, a safety squat. Um, we are, especially at the program with uh, my high school players, we are getting more and more away from spinal loading. Um, we're using safety bars now. We don't really back squat anymore just because the shoulders are so internally rotated. Um, but I, I, I'm a believer in those exercises. So you can see in our program, it's definitely three to one, lower body to upper body for all ages, uh, three to one posterior to anterior, the back to the front of your body. Um, and probably two to one uh, single leg exercises to double leg exercises. So, and then we also threw in a parent program, um, which is down here, uh, because parents are the ones, uh, and I have two kids now that pay for all this stuff, so they should get something too. Um, and I thought this would be cool because my, my kids and I, you know, we're together a lot now, and we tried to lay the workout out the same. Um, so that way the parents could maybe do these with their kids. Um, I, the only thing I would supplement on here uh, for parents or and any of the kids, there's not a lot of pulling. We stayed away from, uh, we went with limited equipment. Um, so there's not a lot of rowing. And, and I know people are doing lots and lots of push-ups push -up, push now. There's all these push-up challenges. We're very, look, at we're all on Zoom and where our shoulders are all internally rotated, you have like this, right? The only thing I would ask people well, when you do do these, if you have access to a TRX uh, or bands, just to add in more pulls. Um, and that would be the same for the parents as for the kids. Um, we also put in, let me scroll back up to the 15. Uh, from 15 and up, we put in position-specific conditioning. Um, now, all positions are different. And... One thing at NTDP in the last year, uh, it being we've created a sports science department. And I want to touch on that because it, uh, people ask what that is. And, you know, strength and conditioning is one piece of that puzzle of a, of a sports science department. Um, we do data collection. So we use wearable technology. Um, the, uh, we're also using force plates. So we're measuring things. So that all those components together create a sports science department. And, and why we've had success with that is uh, it was a cultural buy-in from our coaching staff, our strength and conditioning department of working together to, and we were able to implement the things we wanted to do. And because we did that, we saw some very interesting things um, when it comes to energy systems. And one of those is goalies. And, you know, uh, there's this big knock about goalies being weird. Uh, and that's, I don't think that's the case at all. I think one of the things we've been doing with goalies is training them wrong. Um, across the board. Now, it's no secret, you know, hip surgeries are at an all-time high. Um, and that's because of the butterfly. I think it's because of the sport being so fast. There's so much up and down. But one thing I noticed, and we measure heart rate and we measure heart rate variability. 
um, with our 17 goalies, I was noticing their heart rates just through the roof. Uh, and this is like during the national anthem. Um, I noticed it when the play wasn't in their zone at all. And I think part of that is the, their, the position is more like a, similar to like an MMA fighter or a boxer where, cause they're out there the whole time, but we treat them the same in a lot of ways. And I think uh, that's something uh, as the next couple of years go on, we're really going to address and change. But one thing we did with our 17 team is we brought in a third goalie to practice. And uh, people ask all the time, you know, what's, what's different at the program. And I think opposed to other teams. And I think what the main difference is, is we practice really hard. Um, I, I know everybody's watching the Michael Jordan segment right now. And Michael Jordan said he would, he would attack practice. And, and that, that is definitely what we do. Uh, I think games are kind of the easy part for us. And our goalies suffer from that. Uh, we assault our goalies. Um, and with our 17 team, when we brought in a third goalie, it really changed uh, their workouts and them getting a lot more out of it because we back our workout sessions up to practice a lot of times. Um, so Juan, actually, the last couple of years has put a lot of time into energy systems, and he wrote out these uh, conditioning plans. So Juan, would you want to touch on these at all? Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah, so um, a couple of the goals behind the programs, um, you know, we, we looked at it from a general versus a specific standpoint and uh, thinking of things being very general and not like the sport, which you guys would think of a, a five mile run or a swim, which has nothing to do with the sport. Um, and then something on the other end of the continuum would be uh, something so specific that it looks just like the game. So that, that could be a game, uh, hockey practice, doing certain conditioning uh, drills on the ice with your skates. Uh, we, we decided to, to keep things more on the continuum of having things be a little bit more specific towards hockey, but at the same time, um, make it feasible for all the athletes to do at home uh, on a bike in an open space. Uh, so the rationale behind the workout was uh, to make it look more so like the sport. Um, that being said, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a lot of short sprints, uh, intervals, uh, doing, you know, 10, 15, 20 sets of intervals where uh, those are the demands that, are, that the athletes are going to encounter more on the ice versus something that's nonspecific, like a three-mile, four-mile, five-mile run if that makes sense. Yeah, it's perfect. And I think one of the things he added in here too was like defense are running forward and backwards. Um, one thing I would say to parents or, or coaches that are looking at these workouts, you know, conditioning a lot of times is uh, we've been very focused, go as hard as you absolutely can. Um, I would, I would, I don't want to tell you to not go as hard as you can. You definitely want to do that, but you want quality. You want quality repetitions. You don't want your athlete running so hard they're going to hurt themselves. And most of these hockey players can't run very well anyway. So I would still emphasize quality, quality. Don't, don't bury your athletes. These conditioning plans are geared a little more towards shift length and try a specific to hockey. We, I think there's still a place for long runs and long type of conditioning, but this is geared more towards shifts and hockey. Um, that's why we put goalies, defense, and forwards. So if there's not any questions on the workouts, I think we'll slide on from here unless you got hey, some. Br Brian, I got a question. So um, on the 8 to 12, it has five days a week. And, um, and I know that, you know, as the youth athlete who's playing for fun, they might not be doing five days a week. Um, can you just tell us why and um, the reason behind having just the five different workouts? Well, we, yeah, that's a good question. We put five because more because it's just unprecedented what's going on and to offer parents more, right? So if you do three of those days, that's great. Uh, my, one of my sons is seven years old. Um, we do the workouts every day because we're putting them online and we're trying to help people right now. Um, but my seven-year-old does probably three of the five days. And that's, that's completely fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. My nine-year-old has done a little more. He's missed one here, missed one there. And like I said in the very beginning, you know, there's no proven – the, the one proven thing in fitness is just move, do something every day. And I think what that kind of brings me to would be, you know, one of the other things uh, I wrote down here is talking about regimen, you know. Um, what are pro players doing right now? What are uh, high-level athletes? It's, I think it's 
having a regimen, having a routine, you know, and I, I have two small boys, you know, I can teach someone how to run faster and jump higher, but math has been very difficult, you know, um, and I've had to put some time into that. And, and when this, this all happened and, and hockey specifically, you know, it's a, it, it's a very culture driven sport. It's a very family driven sport. And, you know, if you play hockey, it's a family commitment. It's a lot of time. And like most of my son's friends are from his hockey team, not from his school. And he's a travel player. So he doesn't have a lot of buddies he hangs out with from school. And all of a sudden, all that's gone. Right. So I think the, the one of the big reasons for the five days was just develop routine. You know, like our new routine is, yeah, we wake up a little bit later. Um, we're not, you know, super tight on the, on the schedule of school, but we're, we're on our desks by 10 o'clock. Uh, we do the school for two hours and then we have, uh, we go outside. We're doing the off ice at one, but some days my other, my little guys just roll our blades around and that's completely fine. But I think routine is huge and it, and it helps us mentally. It, this was tough for me personally. You know, I, I lost the gym um, and that's something uh, that's very dear to me. I, I don't go to work. I go to the gym every day and I get to work with, uh, you know, some great trainers. I get to work with the, uh, you know, 46 of the best players uh, in the country every day. And it was just taken away. And that was really hard. And, and I've had good days, bad days with that mentally. But the days I notice that are bad, I, I fall off the routine, the routine. And that's, that's the biggest driving factor behind these programs is to try to help people get some sort of routine and something to put into it. You know, what do you do if you don't, I'm lucky, I know what to do. I can go in my garage and just, just do it. You know, but what, not everybody has that, you know, like people with desk jobs and, uh, you know, and those kind of things. So that was the biggest driving force behind that was just to, to, to help people get a routine. But no, you don't need to do every day. I will say this, uh, my nine-year-old um, is doing this every day and uh, he can't hear me, which is good, but he's looking really, really good. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm letting him even hold some weights here and there. Uh, so it's been pretty, pretty cool uh, side thing that's happened because we've never, he's never done this, this kind of off ice before. Yeah. You bring up a good point about just getting the routine for the, for the kids, but also what uh, Dr. Krelar said, you, they need 60 minutes a day and you know, they're, you know, they need to be out doing something. And this hopefully just gives you a little bit of kind of something that they can go to that, you know, maybe they're, you know, you're sick of having them ride their bike. I don't know. Like, so, but I think it's, it's good that you can kind of pull this in some days, have them play. And I know some areas of the country, there's not even playgrounds available for them. So, right. um, you know, like this kind of just gives them a movement pattern that might be different. So really like Yeah. That. And that's and even our pro players, we have guys in our high level, we have, you know, in Chicago, we have roughly 70, 80 high level players, junior players, triple A players, um, and they're bored. So a lot of them, we've split their workouts in half and they're doing, you know, morning AM and PM stuff just to eat up the day. Um, one of, uh, just to give you a back, like our daily routine too, like we'll do this. Um, we come home, we try to have no technology time after, after lunch, we'll, you know, read or, or if we can't, if I get them to read, um, we try to stay away from the technology, but then we'll go back out after dinner and just do a walk, a family walk. It's just something we've never done before. And I'm sure other hockey families can relate to this. I've never eaten dinner with my family this many times ever. I mean, when we were kids, it was peanut butter and jelly and right to the rink. So that's been kind of a cool thing. You know, not kind of, it's been a, a, a fantastic thing. Um, but that I think 60 minutes would be a minimum, uh, especially for young kids, you know, there's no doubt that they're on technology a lot. So if you can find that extra 45 minutes and just go out and run and we bring a football with us and walk and just launch it. Um, and that's, that's helped us huge. Um, so I'll move on to the, um, I know I wanted to throw this slide in here because a lot of people, uh, you know, training is, has gone virtual. Um, there's we're we're doing this at NTDP. We're going to have all our players on an app soon. Um, we do a lot of online training through our company, GVN in Chicago. Um, actually, pretty much all of our clients have switched over to this now temporarily to help them until we're able to get back to the gym. Uh, but I get email questions and ask questions about this a lot. It's a great option. And there's a lot of good trainers out there that are doing this. Uh, there's a lot of good platforms. Um, this would be more towards your higher level athletes, but uh, a lot of the, these are some of the features that, that you get from online programming. I, I hope this is helpful for people. 
but if you are a triple A player um, or, you know what, even a, a, a tier two player that, you know, your priority is hockey, um, it's a very reasonably priced service now because so many people are doing it. And if you don't have a lot of equipment, it's great because there's just a lot more communication with you and your coach. Um, we have some, I have some guys in the program that have a weight vest and a band. That's tough. Um, and some of these guys we have up five, eight, nine, ten pounds um, because they're working out a specific way to do that with very limited equipment, which is awesome. Um, we also have guys on our app that are, you know, with full gyms, have access to like academies. So um, it's just, it's a great tool and oh, there's a lot of good ones out there. So I, I, I hope that's a helpful, uh, a helpful slide for people that are looking for that. And if, depending on what state you're in, um, at, at most gyms are doing some level of this now. Um, so I'm going to move on to nutrition here. So sports science, um, our, my job at NTDP when I was hired, number one was strength and conditioning or was strength and conditioning was a piece of that. Uh, driving culture was another big piece of, of that picture. And I think um, uh, my or my will and our, and our role at, with the program is to help these players create the, get the life habits and the skills down to become career players. Now, whether they become a career player or not, you know, my goal um, for them when they leave is to understand the basics of nutrition, to understand the basics of fitness and a regiment and understand their bodies a little better uh, and how to stay healthy. So nutrition is a huge factor in that. And a lot of trainers uh, or strength coaches say, you know, it's 90% nutrition, 10% weight room. I, I think it's 50, 50. Um, I picked this slide here because it's pretty, pretty simple. You know, eat more of these, eat less of those. Um, that's it's, it's eating. Nutrition is pretty simple. I think we complicate it. Um, and you know, I, I love sour candy. I absolutely love it. Um, and when I don't eat that, I feel better in the morning, you know, and that, that's, that's my thing. So I think it, nutrition comes down to these three simple terms here. And I stole this from the LA Kings uh, about 10 years ago. This was on every page of their strength and conditioning book. Uh, eat clean, eat often, and hydrate. Uh, I added the greens, greens, greens. You can't eat enough greens. But eat clean, eat often, hydrate. Is that simple? It really is. Um, and like I said, we just complicate it. Um, I'm going to slide up here. So this is a... I'm going to scroll down here, right at the bottom for everyone looking at this. This is strictly a guide. This is not a prescribed meal plan. I am not prescribing you this meal plan. This is information that I just value, I think valuable, um, and it goes hand in hand with training. So as you can see, training day, non-training day, five meal plans, right? The five meals, uh, the biggest thing, eat five, four or five times a day. I, I'm a big believer in that. Um, for protein supplements, and, and this is – I think supplements are something a player or any a client, anybody, a gen pop has to earn. If you don't eat well, there's no point in taking protein shakes, right? Just like if I don't move well, there's no point in lifting weights, okay? So we want to, we, if we can get a lot just from eating right, great. Uh, I have a, a, a great athlete I've worked with in the past, Connor Allen in Chicago. He never took supplements. He's a genetic freak. He played, he's still playing pro hockey in Europe. Um, he just started doing protein shakes and, and, and vitamin supplements, and, and now he's 30 years old. So it's, it, he's been pretty good with nutrition, but I have other guys that don't do that. Um, this bio, we pick BioSteel. We have a relationship with them through USA Hockey, so I put their supplements on here. Um, the non-way would be a non-weight gain. Just what that really means is there's no sugar, there's no carbohydrates in it. It's just straight-up protein um, and amino acids. The recovery is more of a weight gain type of protein. They have a green, a, a vegan protein and a green supplement. Uh, I'm a big believer in greens. I don't think we get enough greens. It's hard to eat enough greens. Um, so green supplements are a good thing to add if you still eat greens. Um, the hydration mix down here, this is something we get asked about a lot um, from parents. Should my kids drink this? Well, my question to all the parents and coaches, do you let your kids drink Gatorade? And... 100% you do. Uh, I know because I do, because it tastes good. I drink it. My kids drink it. It's in every vending machine around. Um, but if you look at the back of the Gatorade bottle, there's lots and lots of words that you can't read because they're huge and complicated. Um, there's a lot of chemicals in Gatorade. There's a lot of chemicals in drinks uh, that are pre-made anyway. So 
what I like with BioSteel, um, it's a very, very natural product. It has a vitamin B, it has amino acids and electrolytes, your five essential electrolytes. So it is a good product. I let my kids drink it. Um, there's a scooper in there. My, my kids, when I make a bottle, it's about this size. This is about a 24 inch, 24 ounce bottle. For my kid, I would put a half a scoop in there. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's like I said, it's the same, very, very, very similar to a Gatorade, um, except it has amino acids in it, which you, you need for fuel. Um, we'll move on from there. This is my favorite slide that I go over with the NTDP players. Um, these are game day guidelines. Um, I actually got these from Cal Dietz, University of Minnesota. Um, really, really smart guy. who's the same thing his players do. And again, this comes down to routine, right? So if you're working out, you have a workout routine, you want some sort of nutritional regimen. So this would be kind of your guidelines. This is geared more towards a game day but this would be relative to your workout time as well. Uh, protein in the morning, balanced meals, uh, fewer fats before games. Fats break down slower, so you wouldn't want to eat like a big avocado right before you work out or a whole bunch of nuts. Um, four to six hours before games, warm meals. Uh, I'm a big, a lot of universities, I know Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, they're giving guys stews and softer, softer foods because they digest a little easier before games. Smaller snacks before games uh, or an hour, hour and a half before a game, just kind of keep it light. Uh, and I think that's different for different athletes. Uh, one of my sons uh, loves to eat right before he plays. He has no problem with it. My other boy does not want, doesn't like to do that. So that's, that's different depending on your athlete. Uh, post game, have a big meal, eat slow. And then the, this is my favorite part of this uh, speech. And usually, I, I, like I said, I've given this to uh, big groups in a room. This is it's kind of strange you're not here. And I know this is a lot of coaches, but staying up late, scrolling and playing video games. Now, I want to touch on that because this is important. Um, and this is something that I'm officially an old man, right? I, I'm, uh, my kids didn't do have to do this kind of thing like my dad would always say. But we didn't grow up with these, my generation, right? We did not have cell phones. So we didn't have all the social media. So we, we played more, we moved more, we did more. Um, and what happens with the cell phones and social media, and we all have it, right? We're all on it. My, my business is on here. My, uh, my communication with my team is on here. I'm on this all the time. And when we're on these phones and, and, and our kids are going on social media. And this is a, there's studies about this. If anyone has questions, you can email me and we can discuss it with more length. But when your kid goes on Facebook or Instagram is the big one right now, right? Uh, all the NTDP players are on there and they post something and they get a like. And you look at it and you're like, oh, someone likes me, right? And it feels good. And then you look at it again a little bit later and you see more likes and more likes. What's happening when, that, when you do that is your brain is releasing a little bit of dopamine, which is affecting our serotonin, which is affecting how we feel, right? And we're getting, un, our, this generation that's come up with cell phones, they're getting unnatural amounts of releases of dopamine all day long, all day long. And it is 100% affecting the way they feel, the way they handle adversity, the way they sleep, the way they balance their emotions. So one of my jobs at the program, you know, is we work on fitness, strength and conditioning, nutrition, and mental health. And I think getting away from the cell phones, and I'm not trying to take your, your kid's cell phone away. I'm not trying to take their technology away. But I have so many times I go on rinks and I see kids on iPads. Get off the iPad. I, I, don't bring it to the rink and your kid can't go on it. And I think it's just limiting the time we're on there. You know, my wife, uh, we, we, we got rid of cable a year ago. And we have it again now that we're in Michigan. But when she got rid of cable, so I downloaded Netflix on my phone. And I started watching shows at night on my phone. So I do it. Everybody does it. And I was having bad sleep and I was having dreams about what I was watching. So my, the point of that is it's, it's, this is new. This is a, it's a new with these athletes. And I think where it's really relevant is with your higher level athletes that are working out two, three times a day and they're getting an endorphin release and that feels good. And now we're on the cell phone and we're looking at our Instagram and all our people liking our pictures and that feels good. But one day that's going to be over and you're not going to be playing sports as much. And, I, and I've, I've helped players go through retirement and I've seen good and I've seen a lot of bad. And it's the bad is always when it comes to regiment. And I, I know I'm not going to get too into this, but I know mental health is a big 
topic conversation, especially with pro athletes. Um, and I would challenge a lot of people out there to before you start attacking the game and attacking the sport about, you know, all the things that are wrong, maybe look at the lifestyle part first and our regimen and our routines and, and how much time we're spending on social media, uh, because I think it's a big, big factor in our development. So, Brian, that, that reminds me of something that I heard when Austin Matthews was, was at the NTDP and how he would um, – so he's from Phoenix, a uh, player and one of the best players in the world right now. And at the NTDP, he knew how much sleep and that was important for him and for his development. So he would give his phone to his um, billet mom or dad, and then th he would not have any calls at a certain time. Because one thing that I – mean, at the NTDP, there's a lot of, lot of schoolwork. There's a lot of work, both physically and mentally, for them. And, you know, if you can commit to that somehow, some way, like Austin did, I'm not going to say that you're going to be Austin Matthews, but, you know, those are small things that maybe might be a goal that they can have. And that, that sleep, it gets more and more. I mean, the more you read up on that, it's, it's the key to everything, you know? Like, absolutely. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I know Marcus Kruger, uh, we work with Marcus, or we have in the past in Chicago. Um, he doesn't sleep with his phone within like 200 feet of his bed. Um, so, you know, guys are really into this now and it, it, it does change it. And, you know, I learned this, I think, I, I believe more people need to know what we do and how we do it the program. And, and one of the things with the cell phones is we have a bag and when you come in the building, your phone goes in that bag. You do not have that bag while you're in uh, that phone while you're in the building, period. We bring it on the road. Um, we have uh, at, at the hotel, we have a che uh, technology check in. They have to check in at like nine, nine o'clock usually, or maybe a little earlier, depending on, you know, the game. Uh, they have to turn in their cell phone, computer, iPads, no technology. And they go in their rooms and they crazy. They talk to each other <laughs> and socialize and go to bed. And I think, you know, I learned this from uh, Jimmy Hughes, uh, the, uh, Jack's father, when I got here and I was having a conversation with him about the program. And he told me this. He goes, it's not enough to just put the sweater on. It's not, it's just it's not enough. You got to go to bed at a certain time. You have to eat right. You got to do your schoolwork or you will not survive, not the way we practice. And if you don't buy into the nutrition, if you don't buy into the regiment, you're going to have a very, very hard time. I mean, it's a, it's a long day. And that's for all levels. You know, that's for triple A, double A, you know, and triple A players even more so because they play so many games and there's no regularity to their schedule, right? Like we have a schedule and I, what's so impressive, I, you know, I've had dozen, about a dozen players go through the program at the pro level that we've trained in Chicago over the years. And I've had guys tell me they put on 30 pounds and I'm like, how is that possible in two years? And I, when I got here, I've seen it firsthand now. And I think part of that is the regimen. We have a regimen, the sleep, the eating, the skating, uh, the lifting. There's, their, their schedule for two years is so regimented at that age. I mean, from 15 or 17 to 25, you're going to peak as an athlete and you are going to explode. Uh, these guys are getting a two-year head start on that. And they're coming out just machines. And a lot of that is the regimen, like Austin did, and, and creating the habit. It's creating habits. That's what the dynamic warm-up, like you know, something as small as that, just having the habit of doing that is so important because when you get to the pros, you're going to add more things to it. That's why we left the long dynamic warm-up on there. So it's regiment and routine. So uh, with the regiment and routine and your players at the NTDP, you know, it sounds like it's boom, 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 boom. Is there any fun that goes on there or what, what kind of, where do they find their fun? You know, like, and I know your answer, but you know. <laughs> well, no, here, that's a great question, actually. What, what's the fun? I, I've been lucky, uh, you know, when I was younger, my goal was to work in the NHL. Um, and about five, six years ago, I got a phone call from Jim Sawyer, uh, his son plays for Michigan Tech, great player. And he, uh, he wanted us to work with his son. He's like, you're going to love this age. And I'm like, really? Ah, we'll see. And he was one of the first youth players we took on. And I did. I loved it. The changes and the growth. And they're just sponges, right? What's great at MTDP is I have a whole team of guys like, like Colin. Colin Sawyer. I have a whole team of those guys. They love this. They love the regiment. They love the routine. They want to be there. It's not like there's one or two guys that have a chance of making it. You know, I have 46 guys that have a chance at making it. So that definitely factors into it. Um, that's the art of coaching right? You can have a plan. You can have all this, 
uh, you know, sports science and all the fancy tools, but can you make it fun? Can you make the, uh, that's, that's the, like we also work with CompuWare and we work with the Chicago Jets in Chicago. That's the culture of the club and the organization. And uh, that was our biggest priority with, with CompuWare and with NTDP when, we, when GVN got here was create a culture where kids want to be in there. And they want to they want to be in the gym and they want to be working out because if you don't have that it's going to make for a very long year. Um, I think the coaches, uh, I, you know, I'm super lucky to get to work underneath Seth Appert and John uh, Robleski. They, you should watch us practice if you're ever in the area. It's high tempo. They're laughing. They cheer when they score. They it's and that's that's the culture piece, right? And I had to do the same thing in the weight room and, and drive culture. And I, so it's, yeah, it's not fun. It's not worth doing. Right. Um, but at, that comes back to, you know, your trainer and your, and your club's organization. I know uh, Topher Scott just put a, a thing out about communication with parents and, and culture is a big topic in our sport right now. Um, and, and, and fact, those factors, how do you drive culture in your organization? I think fitness is a huge piece of that. Uh, but it, comes from the coaches all working together, right? So like uh, Kent Allen in, in Chicago, he's a big believer in fitness and he's taken some heat for it from parents. But in three, four years, you know, he's moving on, you know, 10, 15 plus kids to AAA every year. Uh, and I think from the AA, the tier two programs, you have to have this stuff uh, because it does make it fun. And those kids see way, way more benefit from training than tier one kids because they they have so much more room to to develop. Uh, they're, they're they're not the elite players, and I think this is so important for them because we are taking away baseball a little bit, taking away from soccer, and we are becoming more you know one dimensional sport players. So off ice is a it's a key component in any, and that's also one of the I guess what was one of our jobs. You know, everybody sees all right uh, NTDP hired this new strength and conditioning uh, company. Well, they did hire us to train, but we also have been hired to generate revenue for the arena. Um, there's a huge space, right? And uh, ice time is expensive and, and weight room time, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a component of your facility that could generate revenue um, and also help benefit the on ice, right? If, now we don't have to bag skate anymore. You know, we don't, we don't bag skate our players. We're working on making them better hockey players. That's my, I do that. You know, I bag them. And then I have to figure out how to make bagging them fun. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, it's, that, again, I hope that was a good answer for it. It's just culture. Create a culture. Bring in a team. You know, you're as good as your team. And, I, uh, you know, Will Morlock is a fantastic strength coach. He brings great energy. Um, we have two other guys that work with us that have great energy. Um, and that's – and it's our job to keep that tempo up because – especially at, at our level with NTDP, you know, we have, we lose, we lose a lot. You know, the 17 team loses a lot. Uh, we're getting beat on and it's, we have to still bring that energy and, you know, make them positive. We have a positive experience when they're with us. Yeah. You, and uh, coach Afford's going to be on in a couple of weeks. We're going to have him, and he's going to discuss probably a little bit more about, you know, having that culture and the celebrating and having fun because you have, some players that really, really are, you know, um, uh, developing ahead of other players. So you, like what you're saying, you also got to know what your group is, you know, right. uh, if you're at, if you're at a, a level of maybe more beginners at maybe nine or 10, you're going to have a different workout program or a different type of way that you're going to enforce the fun, not enforce the fun, but uh, encourage the fun then with your players that they know that, you know, they're going up against, um, you know, Ohio State University or University of Michigan or somebody on that weekend that they know that they have to bring their game and however many scouts. So, um, so we got probably about 12 more minutes. I want to make sure that everybody is sending in and we'll continue on this, sending in any questions and we'll try to get them. Um, we'll answer yeah. them as, as best we can. So keep going, yeah, Brian. Are, no, these are pretty much the last two slides. I just put a portion, portion control sh chart on there from precision nutrition and then a hydration sheet. No, that's, that's it on the, uh, the presentation. I would like to touch on that I kind of skipped over on the development side for, you know, 13, 14, 15 and up. You know, there's a huge, uh, and I see this, I have this at the program, and people, one of the questions uh, I get all the time is should kids lift weights? Should kids lift weights? 
that's, you know, something that you, you know, having experienced strength coaches is important because, you know, I have, I've seen 13 year olds, 14 year olds that are developed and can do things. And on the same team, you know, you have a kid that is super long and gangly and, and can't move. So that's where, you know, the off ice is so important to be progressive with it and then evaluate that on the fly. And so everybody can kind of do the same thing, but make it more advanced for some of the kids that are more developed. I, I have some players in the program that, you know, and we all lift weights, uh, but our goalies don't lift nearly as much. And we definitely tone things down and adjust exercises based on the, the different players. So, so in uh, kind of the buzz we're going on throughout the coaching world is needs, needs, centered coaching you know so what the what each player needs not just player centered but needs center and i think that's an important part what you're doing at the program right they have a base kind of thing but then you're fine-tuning each one just hopefully how our coaches when we're coaching out on the ice you know you have your base practice that some skills or techniques that they 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 should have but then you know maybe this player needs a little bit more skating or this player needs a little bit more um, stick handling or whatever it is. So I like that. Are there uh, any questions here? Looks like there's a couple. So, so one said, I noticed a dynamic warm, warm up is in all your workouts, but no defined cool down. Is the movement at the end of your, uh, is the movement at the end of your cool down? Do you feel the cool down after on or off ice workouts is important? And what would that look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. And you know what, um, to be completely honest, we, you know, we kind of threw all this together and I did notice that recently we didn't put uh, specific, you know, uh, static stretching routines and mobility in there. Um, we probably should have put, put some of that in there. You know, maybe that's something we can send out and put together. Um, we wanted to just get something out to people, but no, yeah, you absolutely need to cool down. Um, that's different for everybody. We do it post game. Um, we usually do a little bit of mobility work. Uh, it's usually the hips and the shoulders, a little bit of ankle work, um, and then static stretching. Uh, I think as long as you always warm up properly, uh, that the dynamic warm up could also be used as a cool down and, and going through maybe not the movement prep part of it, but the actual stretches and just moving around and slowing it down. But that's a, that was a great question. Uh, definitely static stretching and uh, we'll get something together for you and sent out too. And, and just a reminder, all of these workouts are actually on our usahockey.com slash dryland. So you'll be able to get all of these workouts. Nutrition will find a spot for that. Um, and then once you get that up updated, we'll put that right back on that dry land page for anybody to watch. Uh, another question from um, our friend in Norway. He says, when we finally do get back on the ice, how do these workouts translate to in-season plan? That's a good question. Um, this would be more of like your phase one for the summer. Um, you, you know, if you're an older, uh, more experienced player, you, you definitely want to progress these workouts, maybe increasing the tempos, making uh, the lifting part a little harder, maybe adding more isometrics. Um, and then so typically how we train in the off season is we have a corrective phase, get them back to neutral. We have a you know, performance phase where we increase strength and power and speed. And then we'll uh, peak the athletes right before their camp. So what I would suggest to you, um, especially since the uh, – this over. Uh, depending on what league you're going to, I know like the NHL is most likely going to do something, right? Um, those guys are going to have another camp again. So usually we taper off and wait, and we get more into speed-specific uh, movements or hockey-specific movements and work on being really, really fast. So I would uh, start, start to taper off the strength section as you get like three weeks away from camp um, and just work on being really, really fast. Uh, oh, so another question is bringing back up the goalies. Um, and you were talking about having three goalies at practice. So typically there's only two per team um, at the NTDP. And I was there a couple, like a month and a half ago, and I saw a third goalie that you guys – bring in every single practice um, and knowing the injury significance on the hip for the goalies. Is there like a butterfly count 
or anything that you kind of have or is it kind of how they feel what what do you yeah that's tough to do especially at the the youth level um i know like jim schneider at university of wisconsin he does count he has a count um i'm not exactly sure how he's doing it but they, they count every time their guys go up and down um that's a great question and uh i'll probably take some heat for this i think how we train goalies uh, and how we develop goalies in our country is wrong um, all the way around. The problem is it's a cult, what we, what I think we are, I'm looking, you know, and I'm, I'm going to work on this in the next year or two and then put some, some literature out about it. But I think one of the, it's going to be a cultural change. Uh, and I don't know if that'll happen. Um, I definitely think at the younger level, we should be having two goalies. I think they should be splitting time all the way up. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, right now, and I will back that up. Uh, whoever asked that in the next couple of years with with data, um, when we brought in a third goalie to our 17 practice, there was a dramatic change in those kids' uh, training and their personalities and how they, you know, well, they're weird. No, they're not weird. They're tired, right? They're carb depleted. They're out there. Their heart rates are through the roof the whole practice. And then you have some goalies that can't uh, mentally handle it. The position as well. They get scored on. They get down. Well pull like put the other guy in uh you know russia and at the u17 challenge last year they were changing their goalies out in the preliminary rounds i don't know they were doing that to you know there's there's definitely strategy behind that um but i think there's i just think the way we manage goalies throughout our country is wrong i think some of the stigmas that, that have been put on them and how they act and how they are i think that's that's false i, I think maybe they may just be tired maybe they're not weird uh, I worked with Al Montoya years ago. I learned a lot from Al. And he's a, a heck of an athlete. He can box. He can run. He can jump. You know, he's a, he's a good athlete. Uh, he knew his body. He knew how to take care of himself. So I think, you know, should you count up and downs? You can. I think at a younger age, it's a little uh, more going off how you feel. Um, if, you know, if your goalies are getting buried in practice, you know, maybe. I, like one thing we had when we first brought our third goalie out was uh, – well, we built a three goalie practice and then we assaulted all three goalies. I was like, all right, that, that may not have been the best, the best plan there. We, you know, our, our, our 18 goalies are more experienced. You know, they know when to take time off. They'll let the guys score, you know, but a younger inexperienced goalie doesn't know that they, they want to challenge. They want to try to play. They want to, you know, I, I'm the coach isn't going to play me because I'm looking bad in practice. You know, I just think we need to really look at how we manage goalies, but for that to change, it's going to be a cultural thing. Uh, you know, throughout coaches, there's a great, it was just posted today, Topher Scott on a uh, hockey think tank. And he put a story, an example in the article about, um, he, it's, it, the article's about communication with parents, but at the end, they split time all year. And at the end of the article, uh, he, he used an example uh, and he was talking with the parents of, well, you know, he was feeling that the one goalie should probably or his has been playing better and has earned it. It was playoffs and I think it was playoffs and he should probably start this game. And they all talked and they said, Nope, we're going to split. They split. They won the championship. Right. So he went, he went against how he was raised in his old way of thinking, which they did all year. And even as a coach instinctively, you want to go with that guy, you know? So I think it's where our focus is winning, right? Everybody wants to win. Uh, but below 15 years old, does it really matter? You know, like, What's the priority? You know, our priority is develop players. And I think NTDP uh, is the, the, the top of that, right? We lose all year long and that's okay. And those kids go through adversity. Goalies need to do that. Um, and lastly on the goalies, Drew Camesso last year at spring training had the best body composition change I've ever seen a player at the pro level all the way down have. He put on 10 pounds of muscle, cut a certain percentage of body fat in six weeks of training. He reached his summer goal in six weeks of spring training. He spent the whole summer working on mobility, um, reactive training, mental performance training. And I'm telling you, in between periods, didn't matter if we were up five or down five, he was locked in. Uh, he handled it great. You know, at least he projected that he was handling it great. So and I, I think that's something goalies – you know, if you can manage your goalies well on the ice and provide, give them uh, good coaching and good resources to work on the mental side, 
uh, a, very similar that a fighter would have to, I think you're going to see way, way better goalies. Yeah, I agree. And I think we're really making strides. And there's a couple, uh, actually, USA Hockey Magazine articles that we've had that we posted the last few months about um, splitting goalies and, and having, you know, the ability and, you know, there's science behind it and there's research behind about what they go through. And we're not going to, this is not goalie day. You yeah. Know, we have that on Thursday. Not about the goalies. But, yeah, but, um, you know, the, I, I, I agree. But I think having these goalies play multiple positions will really help. And finding that right thing in practice. We have station-based practice. That's what we've, we've had. But you go to these station-based practices and the goalies are getting tons of shots and totally out. And, you know, finding that time for their rest as well. Um, so uh, I think we could take maybe – you see any questions that you want to take? Well, just, uh, but just touch on the, the physiological part of that, of that question from Chris, um, the butterfly and, and hip injuries, the dynamic warm-up, the curtsy squat and plie squat uh, activation series, it is crucial that goalies do that, and they do it every day. Um, I didn't come up with that series. That series was designed by um, Steve, uh, uh, Sam Shaw from Movement Physical Therapy, um, and that is – do those activation exercises. Keep your glutes going. Get your hamstrings fired up. You, you know, your adductors fired up. That's really, really important to help you have strong hips so you hopefully limit injuries. Um, so uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. It's, it's been an hour. I understand, you know, be courtesy of your time. Uh, again, we're putting this on usahockey.com slash dryland. These workouts are not – you know, the end all be all, there's a lot of different aspects. And as um, coach Gallivan was talking about, this is just something to get your players moving and help, help them in this time. Um, you don't have to do the full five days for the eight to 12, you know, but um, I, I think it's, it's just a good start. You know, you always want to consult, consult a physician and, and people along those. I also want to uh, tell everybody that we are moving our YouTube live over to usahockey.com or youtube slash usa hockey the main usa hockey page starting next week so um i know we have usa hockey coach but we are moving that all over for next week so i guess i guess you call we got promoted um to the big page um and for tomorrow we have joel johnson who's the u.s women's national coach and he coaches at university of minnesota and kind of what was uh, Coach Galvin was talking about on culture. He's going to talk about that team culture aspect. Uh, Thursday, we have Peter Aubrey, who's the development coach for the Chicago Blackhawks goaltender. And then on Friday, uh, we have uh, Coach Nate Lehman, who is our U.S. national junior coach or U.S. Um, junior team for the 2021 um, tournament. And then also Providence College, he's going to talk. Do you, you have anything else you want to say, Brian, before – no, I one, one question here from Paul Page about evaluations. Um, that's a good question. Evaluations in a team setting is, is difficult. We, we have one that we do. Um, we do kind of a modified FMS, um, and we do that from mites all the way up. Um, just kind of give a, really what you're looking for in those team. You need, a, you need someone good to do it um, that can come up with something like that. But what we're really looking for in those evals um, in a team setting are, you know, big red flags, maybe a couple kids that just are in really bad shape or have a really bad squat pattern. Um, so you don't put them in any compromising situations. Um, but I always tell all my coaches, and this would be something you tell your coaches have, you know, really watch the dynamic warm up. You can learn a lot from your players moving through dynamic warm ups um, and seeing how they move. And, and we come up with a lot of, routines and regimens based on what we're seeing in the first month of training. I hope that was a good answer. That's a really good question. Yeah. And uh, Paul and anybody else, uh, Dr. Dean Krelar has also touched a little bit on kind of the FMS and all of that a couple of weeks ago. And he'll, he'll be back on, on May 6th, on Wednesday, May 6th to do a little bit more practical on the physical literacy piece. So I think that will be a good addition to what coach uh, Gallivan's talking about now and going from there. So uh, without further, further ado, we really thank everybody for joining us. Um, and we will see you tomorrow at 3.30 with Coach Joel Johnson. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Will. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy.